Good morning, everybody, and uh, good day to others who are connecting from different parts of the world. We're going to be talking about decarbonization at this session, so welcome. And uh, we're doing this just uh, literally three weeks before the big meeting in Glasgow, the 26th Conference of the Parties. And uh, we're in a situation where uh, the world is now currently about 1.2 degrees centigrade above the historical average. This is our starting point. And uh, the world is heading to 2.7, <laughs> uh, if all commitments that have been made so far are going to be kept. And it's going to be heading to 3 to 4 degrees if those commitments are not met. So that's the kind of situation that we're in. And it's very clear that the response of governments and the response of all others is simply insufficient. Now, the challenge is huge. And um, we need to decarbonize the world uh, by the middle of the century, and then, in other words, reach net zero. And then we have to go to net negative uh, because life doesn't stop at 2050. And we have to do it in a way that the transition is just so that everybody is able to uh, move forward positively. Now, today uh, we will not address the totality of the climate crisis, but we will focus on a couple of issues, particularly on how to accelerate the decarbonization process and how to begin the process of going net negative. Our objectives for the session are very simple, to explore different dimensions of decarbonization and going net negative. What are the different stakeholders? How does one foster interaction between them? And how to scale up? How to scale up both in time and in quantity? Uh, and then, according to the JESDA model, how to move from research to solutions and then to access uh, i.e. scale. And then lastly, what more can be done by JESDA and by the Genève Internationale uh, to move forward the governance issues, whether it's participation of stakeholders, regulatory action, you name it. Now we have a fantastic panel with us here. Uh, three of our panelists are here and one uh, is somewhere uh, connected. So I'd like to just briefly introduce them. We have uh, uh, Professor Gerald Hauck here on my left. He is a top climatologist, uh, president of the German National Academy of Sciences. He's a professor at the ETH and is a member of the Max Planck Institute. Uh, then we have uh, Professor Wendy Hauck. She's uh, assistant professor at the APFL and she's a material scientist. Then we have Jim Snabe on Connected, and I can see, hello, Jim, nice to see you. He's chairman, supervisory board of Siemens, and he's chairman of the board of directors of uh, Miller Marx, two big companies, and uh, uh, obviously representing the private sector. And we have finally Sergio Mujica, uh, Secretary General of the International Standards Organization, ISO, uh, head of a key international entity that is developing standards. So. We have a, a great team with us. And uh, uh, at this point, before we get into a discussion, we will be seeing a short video. So we can turn the video on. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And uh, that gives us a good, good context, further context. So let's uh, start our conversation with our panelists. And I think I'd like to start with the uh, science. So uh, my first question goes to Gerald Howe. And uh, maybe if you could tell us what science tells us about where we are, uh, about the need to decarbonize uh, the world economy by the mid-century and to, to shift to negative uh, emissions. How does that work? Uh, what are the key challenges in terms of scale, in terms of timing, uh, resources, and also governance? So if you could share a few thoughts with us, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Um, very happily. We thought we could do a two-part session here, and, and we've just come out of neurosciences and have heard doctors. So we can play like doctors here, and I start with the diagnosis, and later we come to the, to the therapy. In your introduction, you already pointed out that we, we are not on track. And I would like to make a bold opening statement. A two-degree Paris target is gone in 10 to 15 years, right? The one and a half degree target is already gone, right? We had 1.2 degree warming and dust in the atmosphere, dirt, aerosols are cooling by 0.3, which has to be added uh, on, on top. So if we would act in the next five to 10 years, there's still the opportunity to keep the two degree targets. And you've seen it, I think it's a, it's a, it's a yes, we can. But the diagnosis is, is pretty simple. We, the atmosphere is now at 420 parts per million of, of, of CO2. I'm 53 years old, we've added 100 ppm in my lifetime. I, I teach at ETH Zurich since uh, more than 12 uh, years, the Earth history uh, introduction class. And the last time we had that composition of the atmosphere, 420 to 450 ppm is, is 3 million years and it flies in warm uh, interval. There was an ice-free northern hemisphere, no ice sheet on Greenland. A very dramatic change was, which is usually not talked about, that there was a situation of could be a permanent El Nino, which means the inner tropical convergence zone, the tropical rain belt is, is, is south, and the rainfall falls in the Indian Ocean, but not on the continent. So you can imagine the vulnerability of the monsoonal world in, in such a situation. That was the last time the Earth's history seen a 450 ppm world. We had three ppm per year. So in 10 years, we are, we are there. And, and this is when we get then other feedbacks into the system. Unfortunately, most of them warm the world. The biggest friend is, our, is the ocean. We have one ocean. It takes up 90% of the man-made heat, a quarter of the, of the carbon dioxide. Uh, we, we emit the terrestrial bias for the other quarter. So this, we have big friends, but the feedbacks are throwing Arctic sea ice and increase in the albedo effect thawing permafrost, methane um, emissions to, to go forward via, via the thawing of cloth rates. So the, the, the one thing which I think our community is trying to convey is this tremendous urgency to act. And where we'll come in the, in the therapy, I think we can. The reality at the moment is we go through the biggest coal revolution since, since the beginning of industrialization particular Asia, but also investments of Japan on, on, on Africa, is that the, the economy is still built up on, on coal. So I think we have five to 10 years for time for action. We do not have a knowledge problem. And I think this is where we go next. And we have a serious implementation problem. So this is where I hope Chester, Switzerland, Geneva, science meeting technology, meeting diplomacy could be very useful. Thank you. Can I just... Quickly follow two short answers, if, if, if you could, uh, just follow up questions. The first one is, when will the effect of decarbonization be seen on the problems, challenges that you have just outlined? Because you have said that we don't have a lot of time, it's urgent. So when will we actually see the, the impact? Well, at the moment, we are still at exponential growth, right? Since the Paris Climate Agreement, nothing has happened, right? I, I drive every year to, to do my class at, at ETH and, and basically add those three ppm to the Keeling curve by burning more than 10 gigatons of, 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 of carbon. So the first and most urgent thing is, is getting out of the coal, right? And then we can go into the much more expensive mm -hmm. aspects of, of, of decarbonization, negative emissions and so on, which we will be desperate probably for in 2035 or 2040 years, obviously, to change and, and, and rebuild the energy system is one of the biggest tasks mm -hmm. we can do. Basically go away from carbon, the carbon cycle into the hydrogen and nitrogen cycles. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a fair amount of research to be done, which I think we will discuss later in the show. So sure. action is needed now, 
but we are still, you know, we've never been further away from a turnaround of, of burning as mankind ever. Yeah. And one other very quick uh, follow up question, because you talked about, uh, yes, we can manage still the two degrees if, etc. Uh, but it seems that we're not doing those things. So isn't this high time that we should stop talking like this and instead say, we're not managing the two degrees unless right the sharpest knife we have is a co2 price and if we could manage this with good good examples starting here in europe and all over europe together probably with the the united states of america and, and probably china that that would be the winner mm -hmm. without that knife there, there's very little opportunity i think and chance that mm -hmm. we meet the paris the paris yeah. agreement i don't think the nations are there and this is when we come to to the therapy then then later i see an opportunity here and with the diplomacy forum of geneva to probably play an active role in communicating that and bringing this mm -hmm. into basically a, a global perspective. We'll come back to the carbon price later, but now I'd like to move to our next panelist, uh, Wendy Queen. And uh, perhaps uh, you could talk a little bit about the role of new materials uh, in the process of decarbonizing the world economy and eventually turning to net negative emissions. Maybe if you could give us even some examples of where some of the latest science is showing some um, some interesting, potentially interesting applications. So over to you, Wendy. For sure. Um, so I first want to say I'm extremely happy to be here and be part of something that is so very important um, for our world. Um, so advanced materials really play an extremely strong role in terms of decarbonization and reaching the net zero target. Um, so Basically, we all agree that, for instance, the best way to achieve reductions in CO2 emissions is to start basically converting to clean energy, so to speak, right? Well, one important part of that is solar energy. And the key is, is that advanced materials are responsible for capturing that sunlight and then converting that into electrical energy, right? Um, so advanced materials play an important role in this. Um, in addition, we can't stop there. Uh, solar energy basically is only good during the day, right? So we need methodologies to then store that energy. And one important thing that we, a device that we need to store energy, of course, is related to batteries, right? Advanced materials play an extremely strong role in battery development and their efficiencies for cathodes and anodes. Um, furthermore, we of course can't stop there, right? Um, we know that historically energy transitions are slow. And so we're gonna continue emitting CO2 from the combustion of fossil fuels for many years to come. And so really at the end of the day, we also need advanced materials to capture that carbon dioxide from large point sources like coal fired power plants, or maybe from large scale transportation like ships. Um, and then we've got another problem. What do we do with that carbon dioxide, right? So maybe we wanna store it underground. Maybe there aren't large storage capacities like here in Switzerland, for instance. So we need to begin to think of ways to convert that CO2 into value added chemicals, particularly into fuels. So we can make this process more circular rather than linear, so to speak. And of course, advanced materials, you need catalysts to help you convert that CO2. Um, and everything that we've talked about is really just reducing our CO2 emissions, right? If we really wanna reach net zero and go negative, um, we've got to really start pushing um, negative emission technologies forward. For instance, direct air capture, you also need um, advanced materials to remove the carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere. So these are all examples. Um, I can give you some specific advance, uh, advances that are made. One or, one or two would be very helpful, I think. Yes, okay, please. so for instance, my group and many around the world are developing highly porous materials that can extract carbon dioxide from um, flue gas from power plants, as well as potentially from air. There've been nice advances made in the quantity of carbon dioxide that these materials can essentially absorb. Furthermore, if you look in the solar cells, um, perovskites, for instance, have gone from three and a half percent efficiency up to, I think, 25 percent in 10 years, which is extremely short period of time. So they're they're moving forward uh, really quickly. Um, but the thing that I have to point out is that at the end of the day in the laboratory, we're working on very small scales. 
So in my lab, I work with gram scales. And you can imagine that doing the basic science behind the development of the materials is already extremely slow. Now imagine trying to get that material up to a large enough scale to go pilot, maybe a half ton scale and much larger for the actual implementation. And so this process is extremely costly and time consuming. And so in my opinion, we need to really find solutions to kind of expedite this particular process in general so that these materials can make it into the devices and the processes necessary to help decarbonize the world. Just uh, thank you for this. And, and uh, one, one quick question, because sometimes one thinks of these new materials and will they create other environmental problems? How do they look in terms of their life cycle impact? We know that for CO2, we're using them to reduce, but in the other areas. This is a very, very important point. And another thing from the lab that, for instance, if I design a new material, I can't know immediately what the life cycle assessment looks like or even the techno-economic impact. And this is another area that we really have to expedite. Because, for instance, if we design a new material, um, say, for instance, for a battery or for carbon capture, and that utilizes a metal, well, these metals have to be mined right? And they're mined from different regions in the world. It can create huge issues with regard to environmental pollution. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of risk management that needs to be done. And basically, in order to do this, we need to expedite things like life cycle analysis of the materials mm -hmm. as well. So okay. thank you. Thank you very much. And, and now I'd like to turn to uh, Jim in cyberspace somewhere. So let's hope he's still connected, Jim Snabe. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, maybe we could start looking at the role of the private sector uh, in this area. And uh, of course, we can talk in general about the role of the private sector. But since you're at the top of two uh, rather substantial companies, maybe you could give us examples of what Merck's or Siemens are actually doing in this area and what lessons we may learn from there. So over to you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, sorry for not being on site today. I would have loved to be there with my colleagues. Um, I guess I'm on the um, therapy side of things. Uh, we've heard the diagnosis. I share the urgency. Uh, we've heard some of the medicine and um, I can share some of the um, actions going on in business. Um, I mean, first of all, you, you, um, you, you look at the, the role of business. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that business plays the major role in the action necessary. Policy makers can create environments which makes it attractive or unattractive to pollute or attractive to solve the problem, but, but we need to do the action. And that, that's a little bit how I, how I look at this problem and hence take on a, a big uh, responsibility um, as well uh, in business. Um, I have you know, one fundamental assumption is that I, I believe we have the technology is necessary. That doesn't mean we don't need to develop much more, but we have enough that we shouldn't be waiting. We need action. And, and so I'm actually driving the point around leadership to act and not just to talk. And I can maybe give two examples. Um, I mean, there's first of all, we see a big trend right now where companies are actually committing to carbon neutrality, um, which is good. Um, uh, but we need to look behind, uh, let's say, the words and, and see if there's real action. Siemens committed to carbon neutrality already back in 2015. So one of the first industrial players to do this. And we committed to carbon neutrality by 2030. And 2020, so um, uh, five years after the commitment, we had reached 54% reduction of our uh, emissions. So at least that's an indication for me that it's possible. And it's not just empty words. You actually need to measure and get the progress. And the 50% first are the easiest ones. So you better get started. Uh, then it gets much harder later on. Mask is maybe an even in more interesting um, example because it tells the problem that, that Wendy was discussing, namely the issue of scale. Um, Mask committed to carbon neutrality in 18 by 2050. And many said, wow, 2050 is far out in the future. But in fact, to be carbon neutral in a shipping company is not so easy. We can't just use batteries. Uh, they would take up 60% of the capacity of the vessel. Um, so we needed to look for other solutions. And to be carbon neutral in 2050, 
we need to have we knew we had to have the first vessel sailing in 2030 um, uh, with a zero carbon technology and then we would spend 20 years to replace the entire fleet of vessels uh, 750 roughly um, you can't just pile that up as waste that would be an even bigger uh, climate disaster so so that's why it was an ambitious plan and and we spent three years to figure out how to do this and we have now zoomed in on power to x um, again a known technology is actually a combination of chemical processes that convert green electricity to a green fuel the fuel can be burned in a combustion engine at, at a normal temperature uh, so we don't have to put high pressure or very you know negative uh, uh, temperature on like like hydrogen um, and it means that if we do this well we can actually retrofit existing vessels with new combustion engines that can be run on this so with that we reach the goal much faster now here's the issue i asked the following question at mask how much green electricity do we need to fuel all our 750 vessels with green fuel um, e-methanol or ammonia and Today we burn roughly 10 million tons of bunker fuel and to convert that to green fuel we estimate that we need 220,000 gigawatt hours of green electricity. That is equivalent to 10% of the installed base to, in 2019 of solar and wind. And we are 20% of the cargo shipping industry. So the cargo shipping industry alone would need 50% of the installed base of green electricity today. So you begin to understand how this is a dramatic scale issue. I don't think it's going to be a price issue. We need an incredible exponential curve and massive investments to get more wind, more sun, more hydrogen, and then more green fuel out of that hydrogen. And this is urgent. Um, already now, we ordered the first uh, eight vessels. We are looking in the market for 400,000 tons of e-methanol. Currently, we can find 10,000. Now, the only good news about this story is that I predict that for the next 10 years, maybe more, the demand for green fuel is going to be dramatically higher than the supply because we can easily sell this green product to our customers. And, and that's, I think, is a good news potentially, because when demand is higher than supply, you actually have a wonderful business opportunity uh, for anyone who invests early. And, and that's maybe my, my last point. I begin to see that it is becoming good business. You make money if you invest in sustainable solutions. We have crossed that tipping point where the discussion should not be, can we afford it? It's almost the opposite. It's a great business opportunity to invest in this space. We estimate that for our industry, there's a need for $2 trillion of investments. And when you hear a number like that, you will go, wow, that's a lot of money. But, you know, if you compare it to the capital expenditure in oil and gas, it's actually only eight, uh, sorry, four years of investments in oil and gas in today's world. So we just need to shift that spending into a green fuel instead and then get, you know, dramatic scale. So I'm a, a concerned optimist. Um, I think we have the technologies. We just need scale. We can see it's possible. And hopefully many business leaders will take the action now. And I do agree with Gerard uh, that if we get a CO2 price, then it suddenly becomes a dramatically better business case to invest. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you also for uh, coming back and highlighting the, the, the really big scale of the problem that we're facing here with a concrete example. So just one quick question to connect something that you said at the beginning and at the end. Uh, you said we have the technologies, we have the knowledge. And uh, then at the end, you said that we have reached a point where it makes sense to do green investment green business so is there some other role still left to make this process go faster by governments or by others or is this now well underway to reach our goals in time no i mean it's it's because we don't have the scale it's still too expensive that's the that's one problem so many business leaders shy away and believe they will have a disadvantage um, so i think there are two things we can do to dramatically accelerate number one 
if if there is a global price in CO2, of course, I mean, we did that question in the boardrooms, both in Siemens and Maersk. We said, let's assume there was a CO2 price of $150 per uh, metric ton of CO2. How would our P&L look like? And I think that's a great indicator for how much money you need to spend to avoid that cost. And suddenly you get um, urgency. And, and the other one is, I think we need to dramatically change our mindset, <laughs> which is the mindset that we can't afford this transition. It's too expensive. It, you have to think of it the other way around. I mean, the, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stone. It, it ended because there was a better technology. And we are looking into that technology now. The price of a kilowatt hour of solar and wind is getting lower than coal-fired power plants. So it is stupidity to um, continue the old path. And it is wise business to actually accelerate the investments in a sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you. So now I'd like to turn to our, our last panelist, uh, Sergio. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about um, your experience at the International Standards Organization, ISO. What kind of standards have you developed that are either directly or indirectly supporting the work of decarbonization and then eventually net negative? And what has been the experience with that? So. Very well, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me echo Wendy in thanking Gesta for this invitation, not only for having the opportunity to participate in person after many, many months <laughs> of yes, meeting, we all. meetings, <laughs> but also for the incredible importance of the topic we are discussing here and the need to, to make a difference. <laughs> so uh, to talk up, uh, about the standard that our ISO is producing, First, I think it's necessary to explain a little bit how uh, the system works. Because ISO was created in 1946, right after World War II, with a strong sense of uh, the need of standards to rebuild the world and to support economic and social uh, development. And I think that 75 years later, uh, the strong sense of urgency is still there. We have 165 country members and what we produce are international standards or in other words global solutions something that makes sense uh, for uh, everybody so um, it's not only the what because we do have 24,000 international standards but it's mainly the how which is important in our value proposition because we work by consensus around 30,000 experts all around the world getting together to take decisions by consensus in a transparent manner and also uh, with full inclusiveness. So everybody's invited to sit on the table, even those who disagree with what we are uh, proposing. So what are we doing now and in terms of contribution to this discussion? I think we have a long-standing tradition in contribution to environmental topics. Maybe some of you know the 14,000 series on environmental management. Um, there is also a number of standards related to energy management, but we also have a relatively new technical committee on carbon uh, capture and storage. And that committee is led by Canada. There are around 20 plus countries participating in that committee, and there are already 11 standards that have been uh, mm -hmm. produced there, and four more in the pipeline. But uh, it's just a, uh, you know, top of the pyramid because there are a lot more to do in this, uh, in this area, definitely. And, uh, but there are some concrete examples where this can be useful, for example, in quantification and verification. IRS from the US has recognized that standard in particular to uh, assess the quantification and verification of carbon uh, reduction. That's just one uh, very concrete example where I think we can make a contribution. But at the end of the day, what we uh, contribute with is a platform, a set of rules where all experts from all around the world can sit together and make decisions by consensus. And it's very much related to what you mentioned about how do we implement. So it's all about implementation. The decision will be made by you know, policymakers in, in Scotland in, in a couple of weeks, but then what do we do with those decisions? How do we implement those decisions? And for that, I think a standard can be really instrumental. 
Yeah, thank you very much. And, and just one area where every time there's a discussion on carbon capture, on various other removal options, the issue of measurement, reporting, verification keeps coming up. People say we're, we're climate neutral. What does that mean? Nobody really knows. So is the standards that ISO is developing will help to clarify that? Yes and no. And let me explain. We, we are developing standards related to verification and quantification, and we have a, a full portfolio on conformity assessment. So it's not only about doing something, but also being able to demonstrate in a way that gives credibility and makes sense to, to everyone. But it's not only ISO, there are many other organizations that are creating those kind of standards about uh, reporting, GRI, and, and many others as well. And the issue here is that everybody likes coordination <laughs> and nobody likes being coordinated. <laughs> and that, that, that's the truth. And, um, and it requires a lot of generosity and a big change in the mindset. <laughs> Uh, so if we want to be effective, we, we do need that, that different mindset and a lot more harmonization. So you'll be working on an ISO standard for coordination in exactly. the near future. Thank you. Uh, I'm conscious of the time, but there was one issue that kept on coming up. And uh, Jim mentioned it, you mentioned that the issue of carbon price. And I just like to have a, a quick, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but a, a quick look at this issue again by our panelists and, and see what, what how can we get there? Because we don't have a carbon price, certainly not globally. There are different parts of the world, different countries, different companies have carbon prices, but how do we get there? And if we cannot get there, what is the alternative? Is there an alternative? So uh, maybe let me start with you. Uh, I mean, uh, Monday we had, we had the meeting amongst the, the Academy presidents and then and it's a G7, G20, the Glasgow meeting. And, and I asked a question to, 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 to the representative, the president from the United States. I asked it to, to all others. And everyone said, we are not ready. So if you take a rational moment, it, it makes perfect sense. Even the most conservative company um, would, would opt for it. And it's really hard to understand this, as I think all the economists from, from you know, European economists, the American economists, and also, I think China is fully aware of the of, of the situation. So I'm still hopeful. And, and as, as just Jim pointed out, uh, beautiful, the, the business model with a carbon price is immediately up. And what the economists tell us is we have to start probably at $50 and then go to 150 or so to be, to be really effective. Already at 50, coal gets too expensive. The cost crossover of renewables with, with burning fossil fuels has already happened. And then we can go towards this exponential growth Jim, Jim, Jim has described. So if you apply any rational argument, and this is, I think, where, where the United Nations could play a role, you would implement it. So it's very hard to, to, not, uh, to, to understand why it's, why it's uh, not happening. It's, it's global policy. And, and I think there are always some, some fundamental aspects which go to something humankind is unfortunately mm -hmm. having sometimes. It's, it's, it's greed, mm -hmm. right? And this is the way we have to move out because the business model is obvious. Okay. Jim, would you like to add something to that? Um... Only very short because it was exactly uh, right. Um, it has to be a global price, or at least the main regions, uh, China, US and Europe has to participate. Otherwise, you're just moving the problem around. You're not solving it. OK, thank you. Uh, any uh, colleagues, any further comments so on I this? So I just have one. Um, so I, I totally that. agree with with the previous comments, but I would also potentially like to add that it's very important that we understand how this carbon pricing is going to actually impact the reduction in CO2 emissions. And for me, this is still a, a difficult thing to also see. So I think that part of it also needs to be worked out as well as how we implement the actual pricing process is how is it going to actually impact our reductions and help us reach negative emissions. Mm -hmm. So it has to be put towards advancing these technologies and, and things like that. So, okay. So, George, do you have any comment on the price issue or? No, no, not okay. really. I, okay. I fully agree with what has been mentioned. Right. I, yeah. I have one more comment. I mean, it's sure, important. Please, yeah that we socially balance this, right, globally, but, but also within the countries. You don't want to go to a, to a yellow vest situation. 
But also there, the economists have very good plans to have social balance and then a reinvestment of the price in new technologies and getting out of the coal, which is the trivial aspect. But the social, the social balancing, I think, is a, an important part of a consideration here. Yeah. All right. So before uh, looking at the public and trying to get some thoughts from them, uh, we would like to find out what you think about these issues as a whole. And we're going to do a little bit of polling. <laughs> so if uh, if our colleagues can turn on the, uh, the, the screen for instructions, uh, please do. Uh, is it visible? Not yet, no. Uh, but in the meantime, you can pull out your phones. Is it coming? Here we go. So please uh, look at the instructions <laughs> and, and uh, uh, enter the required code that is there, just the 21, and then uh, join the poll, and you will see uh, then the next screen what you need to do. So, uh, if you're in there, then the question is uh, the world is. Uh, uh, not on track to scale up for global decarbonization and negative emissions. What do you see as the most important impediments? And then uh, you just rate them one, two, three, with three being the most important impediment. So please uh, go ahead and start uh, giving your answers one after the other, and then we'll see the results. It's almost socialistic. How do, you, how do you move to the next question? Yes. Oh, it just does it automatically. Yeah. So let's see. This is very exciting. Ooh. <laughs> So we clearly don't have too many overabundance of standards, so we're okay. You did a good job. Yeah. But the political leaders. Um... <laughs> I'm actually excited to see the high um, number two, private sector motivated only by profit motive. Because if I'm right, it's a better profit to be green than not. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's move on to the next item. Could we, yeah, that's it? Yeah, okay. All right, well, uh, we've, we've got a little, maybe we can come back next year and see what it looks like. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, after that. So uh, with that, uh, I would now like to open the floor for questions from the participants and please raise your hands and there is a, a microphone on a drone somewhere that will find you uh, <laughs> or maybe one of my colleagues will, will take it there. So we have a gentleman up front. And if you please uh, try to be brief and if you can direct your question specifically to one of your on our panelists, please do so. Yes, sort of. <laughs> not, not. There you go. Okay, Jean-Pierre Dantin, APFL and uh, E4S, Enterprise for Society. I just intervened because we just concluded a workshop with 25 economists about uh, notably the environment. Uh, this was part of JESDA. We had our session earlier this morning. And of course, we talked about the CO2 tax. As you mentioned, the CO2 tax has 95, 97 to 99 two cents approval by economists. This is really the, as it was mentioned, the, the sharp knife, okay? Mm -hmm. The problem is that getting it through is not easy. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. I think it was a mention of the Gilets Jaunes. It's a mention of political leaders. It's a bit of a both. I mean, it's the fact that uh, you need to convince the people, not only the business people, but only the people in the street that uh, they are, that an extra tax is really necessary. 
And, and this is extremely difficult. So we were a bit less optimistic, I think, in our economist session than you were. <laughs> Uh, and what was the solution? I, I don't know. I mean, we, we propose a number of alternatives, which are make it up for the fact that we have no CO2 tax. But clearly, the first best is to go for the CO2 tax. And what I would like to say is probably, indeed, coming up from the top, from not only from economists, the trust in scientists is not sufficient, not only from government, because the trust in government is a real problem, including the fact that the government are going to redistribute the profit of the tax. People don't believe in it. But of course, uh, tr the, tr uh, the, the power by other scientists, by business people, after all, in Switzerland, we got to a 50.1% vote against the CO2 tax. It's not that we need a lot, but we need something a lot more. And, and I think we need everyone, including probably the multilateral and the multinational, uh, multilateral community, because things have been able to move from multi multilaterally a bit better than at the national levels. Yes, please. Uh, Jean-Pierre, th thank you. I think you make a very important point, and, and Shim said that we have to be in our communication also much more optimistic about the investment, right? And if the lower third of the income, at least in, in, in our rich worlds, would probably even benefit from, from a CO2 price and get something back, and the others would basically move out of, Jim had the picture, the, 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 the Stone Age into some a, a sustainable future with cleaner air and whatever. But we have to change the communication and be much more optimistic that yes, until yes, we can, and and basically provide provide that trust uh, all together. Thank you. I mean, it's what we need to do. Sergio. Yes, on my side, I think it's there is a clear gap between what is important and what is urgent. So I think we all agree that this is a very important topic and. and we need, we definitely need to act. But when it comes to urgency, uh, that's a, a very slippery concept. What does it mean, urgency? Because when it's about having food, access to food, access to health, access to very basic stuff, a threat that is going to happen in 15, 20 years, it's like, this is not for me because I need to eat. So there is a lot in the narrative and awareness raising and also in the communication we make. So we need to bring that sense of urgency to earth, to, to reality. Okay, Jim, I, I can't see you, uh, so if- you... Yeah, yeah, I would love to maybe just add a comment on that. I mean, first of all, we have been able to implement a VAT in most countries in the world without any good reason other than I need more taxes and it's a consumption-based tax. And so why is it that we think it would be impossible to implement something as urgent as this? I understand the Yellow Vest, but this will actually give a lot of proceeds in the early stages. And we could use some of that to socially uh, balance out the impacts. Uh, so that's my, my first comment. Um, and my, my second is um, we actually did the calculation. What is the green um, extra cost for a pair of sneakers transported from Asia to Europe? with green fuel, with today's prices, which is two to three times higher than the bunker fuel, it, a pair of sneakers would cost five cents more. So I think we should get into the realities of things and, and just not allow ourselves to postpone this urgent matter because of some um, possible problem with pricing. We cannot afford not to do this. Interesting. We keep coming back to this issue. The scale is huge, yet we can do it. <laughs> it's possible. Any other questions? Yes, I see a question on the back there on the right. Hand side. Well, okay, lady here first, and then we go to the back. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Anusha. I'm sorry, I'm CEO of X Prize Foundation. Uh, we just recently announced a very large competition, hundred million dollars, specifically to address the scaling issue and be able to get to gigaton level uh, carbon extraction. Um, my question is, um, while we are doing that and believe in that wholeheartedly that technology can get there, the pricing is always uh, you know, an issue that comes up that we're not addressing. Um, you talked about tax. Have you uh, thought about risk pricing? Because uh, climate change brings with it um, risks that will negatively impact companies, whether it's uh, uh, weather 
conditions that uh, disrupt shipping containers or operations or farming, many, many different ways of pricing risk. But we've never looked at that. Insurance companies do that successfully. Financial institutions do that successfully. Why can't we look at climate risk and pricing climate risk? Risk pricing. Uh, which one of our panelists would like to address that? I mean, the, the, the Stern report did, did this a decade um, ago, right? And it's, it's clear, and, and, and Jim and others have said it, that we can't afford to, to not go for it, right? I mean, I mean, reinsurances, I think, are all, all for, for action, right? This, this is a big business here in Switzerland. Also, the, we just had in one of our Chester sessions the CEO of the, of the Allianz who is, who is there. So you wouldn't find anyone rational who, who would not go, go for it in particular. The risk is just so high. But what we still don't have is any plan for, for negative emissions on the, on the gigaton level, right? And uh, it would be a longer lecture, but if you chop down the Alps, throw it into the Southern Ocean, you can delay the, the warming by, by feeding the ocean by 10 years, right? So this, this is one of those scale examples where we still have the best chance by mitigating the burning. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> Any other comments from the panel? If not, then we have the speaker, uh, somebody who would like to speak at the back. Oh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll I... get to the back of the room in a moment, but please okay. go ahead. Yeah, can I do? Um, I'm Johan Negruciu, Michel Serre Institute in Lyon, France. Um, and uh, probably my question uh, is addressed to all panelists because it's a matter of uh, getting sharper terminology definitions. Um, as an outsider, I might be not catching the right, uh, the, the right uh, uh, issue in this definition terminology uh, considerations, but decarbonization, to my mind, needs clarification in terms of where we speak about carbon substitution from fossil to green carbon, and where we do really um, consider that decarbonization as a 100% decarbonization process. So it seems to me that there is a mixing of uh, substitution of carbon and uh, decarbonization per se. Thank you. Any, anybody would like, you wanna go ahead? I can start more, more generic. I mean, you have to move away from the carbon cycle and substitute it in a hydrogen world, probably with the nitrogen cycle. Ammonium is one of those ways to carry hydrogen. Or you make out of uh, this carbon capture and use, uh, you, you go for a synth synthetic methane, which still is the carbon cycle, but it's, 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 it's carbon neutral. And I think with scientific progress in, 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 in catalysis and on whatever, this, this could be also more cost-effective. Jim said it's a factor two to three more expensive, but the technologies we, we have in hand. Let me use the ISO hat here. Uh, one of the things that can be standardized is precisely vocabulary and cross-cutting terms. And we do have a standard uh, on that, uh, but of course need to be enlarged. So the concept is that we bring everybody together and we agree on the terms. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so I was, I was gonna say in, in, lines with, in line with this, um, basically, one issue looking at things from my perspective versus you know large scale and how a material is meant to perform it's it's really difficult for us to know when we're working on a gram scale really what criteria a material needs to meet in order to be applicable um you know for ton scale carbon capture so how we test our materials and application relevant conditions this can be a, a really big problem in the lab and, you know, it, it's really important for us to, to have, um, I think, performance evaluating criteria for us to know that, hey, this material really has a potential to make an impact. And I think that this is something that, you know, you could help us with. If, if we've seen, for instance, hydrogen storage in the US, you know, DOE put forward these criteria kind of that needed to be met that people were kind of following with regard to materials development and things like that. And I think a lot of these different technologies, we need to bring so many to market and so many to scale 
that we need to begin to think about how we identify how should the material perform at the lab scale for us to start scaling it up and what materials does it need to be made from because if you look you know at large scale production if you're using a, a noble precious metal to to design your materials that might not be feasible for large scale applications and so we really have to look at these things at the beginning mm -hmm. okay. i believe jim you want to uh, add to this well no just uh, you know i'm a practical kind of guy and uh... I think you're right that there is some uh, terminology and, and perfection needed, um, but it shouldn't delay the progress. Um, in, in 2018, Mass committed to carbon neutrality, and, and to be honest, we had no idea how to do this. Now, we could have debated for another three years without committing to anything and gotten it maybe right. I, I don't even think so. Right now, we ordered eight vessels, and we have no idea how to get the fuel. It is kind of this chicken and egg problem where we sometimes get caught up in perfection and I'm very much arguing, get started. We order eight vessels, there's a demand for green fuel. If there's a demand for green fuel, which is higher than the supply, somebody will see the best business opportunity and they begin to act. And then suddenly we, by pragmatic doing, um, move forward. And I think we should do that in parallel to the taxonomy and get it right. Otherwise, we don't get the urgency and the action needed. Right. Thank you very much. And I think we have time for one more question. I believe there's a student in the back uh, who's been trying to uh, to get a microphone, maybe on that side. Yes. OK, please. Thank go you. Ahead. Hi. Yeah, um, my name is Yannick Bucher. I'm a student at the Graduate Institute just around the corner here. Um, and I assume I'm representing the youth here. Um, my question is uh, regarding the sharpest knife we have that uh, was mentioned, and I assume we have another sharp knife, or maybe it's the elephant in the room, um, uh, subsidies on fossil fuels. Um, so the IMF recently released a study with an outrageous number of 11 million US dollars in subsidies, implicit or explicit um, per minute on fossil fuels. And I was assuming, so I would address this question to a government official, but um, I'm giving my shot now with the panelists that we have from your field, um, how to address this um, rather big issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a big issue indeed. So any reactions? A straightforward, rational CO2 price and of course no subsidy. It's ridiculous to subsidize that and this is done I was in Germany, if you think of the diesel price and, and, and whatever, the, the subsidies are all over the place and they, they got to go. You're right. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's ridiculous. We, we discussed this. Can we afford the transition to this uh, green future? And um, if we shift the investments, as I talked about earlier, it's actually not so difficult. Um, so, of course, we shouldn't subsidize. Uh, I think with the green fuel and the technologies around power to x we actually have a chance to kind of reuse a lot of the current assets, which is my biggest fear that the transition takes too long because all the assets need to be replaced. Um, but we have a lot of assets in this world that can contain a liquid uh, fuel, what if it could just be green instead, whether they are pipes or tanks or uh, chemical uh, refineries. Uh, uh, or combustion engines and, and so then the transition becomes much much faster and and you're absolutely right of course we should not subsidize something that is bad it just doesn't make sense thank you Jim. any other thoughts on this question um if we have a very very short question we could do one more just one so uh if uh maybe over there uh Please take the microphone quickly so we can uh, and try to be uh, brief <laughs> and we'll try to be brief in our answers. So yes, uh, now that we're dealing with elephants, I've heard nothing about the more controversial issues here with geoengineering. So number one, nuclear. I don't think I need to say more about nuclear. You all know what the implications are there and the controversy around it. And the second one is uh, David Keith has been saying for a decade that with solar resource management, seeding the stratosphere, 
uh, with either sulfates or nano umbrellas, we might be able to reduce the rate of growth in terms of climate every year, and that we should be at least experimenting with that before the pressures arise in some nations to act on that without actually knowing the implications. So perhaps you could say a little bit about those two controversial issues. Thank you. Well, I, I'm a geologist by training, and we kind of have any idea on what to do with nuclear waste. So I find it problematic, in particular, if we make a full cost calculations, renewables, and every, you know, any of those directions is much cheaper and, and safe. And I have a strong opinion on geoengineering. It was actually my, my colleague in mines at the Max Planck Institute, Paul Kutzen, the Nobel laureate for ozone chemistry, and also the the man who thought about the Anthropocene concept. And he, he was one of those to introduce the solar engineering and he withdrew completely from it because it would be a very cheap excuse to keep emitting CO2, do nothing. And you have to do this in every year while we accumulate CO2, right? To some five, six, seven, another 800 PPM. We have no idea what we do with the Earth system. A good friend of mine is uh, Tapio Schneider. He's the climate chief at Caltech and they, they have a new model going and even if you do so at some seven eight hundred ppm you would lose as a feedback the stratocumulus clouds of the tropics which would double the man-made impact so you're then approaching those three four degrees and which is double up to eight we we've, we see this in earth's history we call it um, runaway heating so for me, the solar engineering is, is if, if you want to think as a doctor again, you have a, a cancer patient, which is treatable, and you just give him heroin, or right? it's, it's, it's kind of relieving the pain, but I think it's a very bad idea. And maybe I can comment as well. I think in the, the topic um, is an important one. The elephant, at least the first one, is a challenging one. Here's, here's my assumption. We, we need a dramatic uh, growth in solar and wind and right now it seems like we're running out of space in Germany it can easily take seven years to get approval for a wind uh, farm seven years because nobody wants it in their backyard and so so if we don't solve this problem of space uh, for the green electricity we will be forced to find other ways otherwise we'll postpone the carbon neutrality. And, uh, and that's my concern. Now, there's one hope that I have is that Northern Africa could be an extremely valuable source, uh, in particular for generation of not just green electricity, but green hydrogen and green fuel. Um, so there's a lot of sun, the installations would be relatively cheap. Um, they are much cheaper than any other energy source. And on site, one could create the hydrogen as well as the green fuel. Um, I think this could be an opportunity for Africa to play in the world economy and thereby also create livelihood uh, in Africa. Thank you. I think we're, we're coming close to the end. And uh, I would just like to ask my panelists, colleagues, if you have 10 seconds of any last thoughts that you want to leave uh, before I close the, the session. So uh, we can... We need electrons and molecules and we can do it. Okay, all right, that's easy. <laughs> Wendy? <laughs> no, uh, basically I think we just need to expedite the technology development in the best ways we can. Mm -hmm. Sergio? Combine talent, industry, science, academia and government with a strong sense of urgency. Jim? We, uh, this is becoming a good business, so it's time to invest. Okay, well, thank you very much. and. Uh, Thank you for being with us. This has been a, an amazing session. I think we heard a lot of interesting ideas. I think for me, the, the bottom line takeaway here is that on the one hand, we are in a very serious situation. It is very serious. It requires massively scaled up action at the political level uh, by <laughs> governments. That means we have to get going. Sorry about that. Stop your net. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, so it, it needs, uh, we need to respond to that scale, but there are positive uh, developments, there are opportunities here in private sector, we heard materials, uh, there are ways to go ahead, but if we don't get our act together, then it's going to be very serious and we have to say pretty much goodbye to our sustainable development goals because we're not going to meet them. And this is where the last question, I think it is relevant, we need to talk about 
these other unthinkable options. It's not because they will be necessarily good or bad. We don't know that yet, but we need to talk about it. And, and I think that's uh, something I've written about. And if you read 100 page 144 of the JESTA radar, you find some more reflections of why we need to talk about it. Not why we should use it, but why we need to talk about it. Thank you. <laughs>